Good morning, Madame. Morning, Father Tear. See if you can tell me what this is. The molar of a woolly rhinoceros. The molar of a reindeer. The buckle cusps are sharp, so what does that tell us? Actually, I knew it was reindeer. I was trying to make you feel good. You were bound to be nervous the first day. <laughs> it tells us that the animal was less than three years old. Why should I be nervous, madame? Alone with an attractive woman for a whole morning. It has happened before. In Paris? In Paris. Heavens, tell me all about her. She was half a million years dead. Tell me why an assistant professor in Romance languages wants to identify and catalog a bag of bones. Because it'll make a nice change from teaching Manzoni and Cervantes and Victor Hugo. I met an American girl last year, name of Ruth Sattel, anthropologist. When she heard my husband and I spend our summers in the Pyrenees, she got all excited. Her big dream was to find a fossil man in the Pyrenees. Well, that's why she'd come to France. I thought, I found my French man. Why not help Ruth find hers? We did our dig, she got her guy, and I got the leftovers, which are fascinating. So for me, the next stop was the Natural History Museum. Madame, you may have charmed the director of this museum, but you have signally failed to charm me. You are an amateur. I am a professional engaged in professional research. Professor Boole was mistaken. I do not have time to supervise your hobby. Now please take your toys and go. Toys? Well, give them to the caretaker if you don't want to play with him yourself. He has grandchildren. This way, Madame Dilettante. How dare you? How dare you? I am not a dilettante. When I agreed to help Ruth, I spent months going to lectures by Professor Bull right here in this museum. Tertiary and quaternary mammals, lectures on paleolithic... I studied for hours every day. We found a cave in the Pyrenees. We were absolutely professional. Mapped it, dug it for four months, sifting the soil, sorting the fossils. I want to study for a doctorate in paleontology. I am absolutely serious. I am not a dilettante. How were the Pyrenees formed? What? Elementary geology. How were the Pyrenees formed? I don't know. Goodbye, Madame Ida Veillon Couturier. Is your husband Paul Veillon Couturier? Yes. The notorious communist, the red deputy, and I'm a red too. Professor Bull's little joke, asking me to supervise you. He's a notorious anti-clerical. Goodbye, madame. Back to your books. I wasn't interested in geology, but animals. Bones, not stones. I didn't need to know about geology to help my friend. If you want me to learn geology, I will. But it was fossils of prehistoric mammals I was after in the Violet Cave. You know, it wasn't easy for me either, you know. Yet yeah, given my beliefs, being told I'd be working with someone dressed like you. But Professor Bull said you were the best person to supervise my research, and I want the best. He knows I'm serious. Try me again. Pierre. Pierre de Jardin. Peter. Saint Peter fished for men. How many converts will Father Pierre hook measuring Chinese rats? Oh, rat moles, sorry. <laughs> well, why moles, not souls? <laughs> Madam. Jesuits are bound to preach the gospel, certainly. But if we have particular gifts, then we're encouraged to use them. I'm a geologist. Ad majorum dei gloriam. To the greater glory of God. Studying stones adds to God's glory. Hammering rocks, nonsense. In the beginning, madame, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth for us to live on and to love. You're having a love affair with Mother Earth. <laughs> yes. Yes, madame, in your brash American way, you've put your <clears throat> finger on it. All my life, I've been in love with the earth, with matter, or rather with something that gleams at the heart of matter. Spirit is the higher state of matter. The Christ who created matter <clears throat> created that fossil, madame. Ida. Uh, madame, tell me what you've learned about it, as if in a formal report. This is the skull of a prosyphneous rat mole. There were two major stages in the evolution of the rat mole. 
First, the pro-Siphnia stage. With molar teeth rooted and cervical vertebrae all free, as in this example. Second, the Siphnia stage. With molar teeth rootless and cervical vertebrae partially fused. Which leads me to deduce that the Garden of Eden was in China, and Adam and Eve lived near Peking. <laughs> Don't joke, madame. Was I joking? Don't waste my time. Was I joking, Father Teor? <laughs> Wasting your time. Don't you believe in paradise? Uh, Adam and Eve and all that. Talking snakes, sinful apples. Morning, Father. Uh, madame. Uh, Father, Professor Bull would like your advice about a brain pan he's been studying. He thinks it might be related to Pithyroctopus. No, uh, Pithycanthropus uh, uh, erectus. <laughs> and uh, the Secretary of the Geological Society hopes that you might dine with him one day next week. <laughs> Very well, madame. I confess. It's impossible for a man to believe in Genesis and Darwin at the same time. <laughs> impossible. You cannot focus your mind on the picture of the world given us by geology and at the same time the picture of the world given us by the Bible. You can't focus on both simultaneously. You have to move from one to the other and back. One for weekdays, one for Sunday. Exactly, madame. The two pictures clash. They ring false. So you were wrong. You can't worship nature and supernature. I'm a scientist. I can't believe in the Garden of Eden. Ten acres of Mesopotamia, magically free from suffering and death. It's ridiculous. However old the human race is, however old the rocks are, there isn't the smallest vestige of a golden age, the earthly paradise. Wherever we look, we find that life was subject to death from the very beginning. You're a heretic, Father Tear. <laughs> Saint Paul would have you burned. Through sin, death came into the world. That's what he told the Romans, didn't he? How do you know that? You're supposed to be a communist. I used to be the president of the Young Women's Christian Association as a student, before I saw the light. The devil is famously a well-read theologian. <laughs> At all events, you're right, madame. Per peccata mors. For Paul, death, the phenomenon of death, came into the world through the sin of Adam. Before that sin was committed, the Lord God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But you're a scientist in 1924. You know Paul was as wrong as a man can be. So farewell, fall of man. Adios, Adam and Eve. Michelangelo, the Sistine is a beautiful lie, but thanks anyway. Not quite. Why not, Father Tear? Are you saying St. Paul was right? Knew more about science than you do? Father. What? Professor Bull's bedpan. Brain pan. Brain pan. <laughs> I'm coming, Joseph. I no longer believe Adam was a single individual. I no longer believe that we might one day dig up his bones somewhere in the Near East. All that science allows us to say is that when we first see the human race, we see a group, we see a crowd, which may, must have appeared gradually through a number of avenues. No wonder your church prefers to pop you in a lab and not a pulpit. So I was right. Father Tear no longer believes in original sin. Oh, but I do. I do. How could I not? We see its effects everywhere. Disease, torture, war, death, dissolution. These things are the condition of the entire world. But it's not original sin as St. Paul understood it. As Holy Mother Church still understands it to this day. It wasn't the sin of Anne Adam. It was built into the fabric of the world ab initio from the beginning. In the beginning, God created sin. And science calls it evolution. <coughs> God created a world that evolves. The story of Genesis, the creation and fall, it symbolizes a universe in evolution. Adam and Eve are images of mankind striving towards God. Omnis creature ad hoc im gemisit et patiorit. The whole creation is groaning as if giving birth. That's where Paul wrote, truer than he knew. Not a cosmos, but cosmogenesis. There is birth, life, growth, suffering and death, but there is growth, change, evolution. Not a cosmos, but cosmogenesis. You have prosyphnius and then you have syphnius. Life grows greater. Or worse. No, madame, ever greater. There are mistakes on the road, of course, painful defeats, but it's the victories that count. 
Cancer seems a high price to pay for evolution. It is worth it! Suffering is the lifeblood of evolution. If you want to evolve beings with free will, be beings who can love, then suffering is the price. You're not ill, madame. No, I'm fine. Just a bit taken aback to hear all this coming from a man of the cloth who isn't Anglican. <laughs> what does your church think about all this? <laughs> My church doesn't know. You haven't yet. <laughs> you haven't published your thoughts? No. Uh, but I put them in a paper a couple of years ago, a short essay. Well, if it's not in Latin, I'd love it's to read it. It's not in Latin, uh, too easy for the cleaners. Um, it's in classical Greek type backwards. Oh. I do joke occasionally, madame, it's in French. Still interested? Of course. How do we know Neanderthals were a separate species? What evidence we have suggests that. Skull morphology and so on. Suppose they did interbreed with humans. Suppose it could be proved. What then? Then theologians would have an even bigger problem than they have already. But a brave theologian would bet it will never be proved that humans and Neanderthals interbred. Would you bet that they never did interbreed? No. Thought not. I'd like to prove they interbred. Have a go, at least. It'd be interesting. Yes, me, Ida. Well, how long would it take for me to train as a paleontologist? Six years. Six years? <laughs> That's nothing. It takes 15 to train a Jesuit. <laughs> yes, madame. You could get a doctorate in six years if you work hard and don't argue with your supervisor. But that's half the fun. <laughs> and it'll give Joseph something to worry about. Joseph? What's he worried about? That I'll hit you? <laughs> that you'll fall in love with me. I have no desire to feature on the front page of Pravda. <laughs> that was a very vile thing to say. Vile. Apologize. I apologize. For your penance, read Das Kapital by Karl Marx. I already have. Wow, I'm impressed. I've always enjoyed fiction. <laughs> fiction. Well, let's just say that he's got his basic economic facts wrong. What? Careful, Father Taylor. You are sailing very close. And he's completely wrong about class war. Don't you dare criticize Karl Marx. As for his reading of Hegel, Marx was utterly out of his depth. Listen, madame, let us begin by considering his theory of surplus right, value. Right, that is it. I've had enough. I've had enough of scraping bones. Uh, you just said you wanted to get a doctorate? To hell with that. Marx wasn't wrong, but I was. I was prepared to give you a chance, a chance to prove you weren't just a cold-blooded Jesuit, totally unaware that what matters in this world isn't bones and ideas, Father Tayar, it's the people in it. There's someone else in this room besides you, and it isn't Darwin, and it isn't Huxley, and it isn't... Who was that guy you said got you besotted with evolution? Henri Bergson. And, and it isn't Bergson, it's me! Oh, God. I was a fool to think it would be a great, a great idea to drop studying literature, life, human joys, birth, sex and death, the whole human drama, to drop everything that makes existence on this planet worthwhile and bury myself in a geology lab, a, a fossil factory, a museum, closeted with a desiccated celibate who can't tell the difference between a prosythneous rat mole and a woman. Ida! <laughs> Ida! Glory be to God. He's remembered I've got a Christian name. And what's more, he's used it. There is so much more to being human than birth, sex, and death. Mere animals have all that, but we are mind, we are spirit. The most exciting thing that can happen to a human being is to stumble on a new idea. Now, I believe the more complex a structure is, the closer it comes to being alive and thinking. How so? <laughs> Because there is a within of things, as well as a without. Even atomic particles must possess pre-life and pre-mind, because the universe is a consistent whole. I like that. Neat. And as we know, on planet Earth, certain molecules developed into tiny living beings. 
Simple cells evolved into multi-celled organisms. Then came animals with a nervous system and a brain, and as brains grew bigger and better, there finally emerged the stupendous breakthrough, consciousness. After millions and millions of years, we had arrived. The universe was at last conscious of itself. Oh, Pierre, I love that. That is thrilling. I, I never thought of it like that. What a thrilling idea. Shame it's not true. Our globe was now enveloped not only by a layer of life, the biosphere, but by a layer of thought. I believe this, the story of evolution is the transformation of physical energy and matter into spiritual energy and matter. Now, I'm going to stop you. Father, stop, stop. <laughs> you got me for a minute, I, I admit. <laughs> but in fact, you're talking nonsense. It's just words, just words. I'm sorry, but human beings are the insignificant byproduct of blind chance and the laws of nature, and that is all. And we're due to be totally extinguished when the sun explodes. <sighs> Father Tear, the universe uh, is just a, a meaningless quadrille danced by atoms and molecules. I refuse to believe a performance of the B minor mass in the Sistine Chapel is just atoms being complicated. Bach and Michelangelo are more than just chemistry. There is an underlying power at work, and it isn't blind. The universe has a direction. You are wrong, madame, and Bergson was wrong. There is a final goal, the final stage of the journey for all these minds, these persons, to grow together in knowledge and love, to converge, to unite as a single arrow soaring towards the single goal beyond time and space. And because the emergence of persons in the universe is the highest good, is it not obvious that the goal of evolution must be the supreme person, Jesus Christ? And our humble task, as St. Paul almost said, our task is to become cells in the body of Christ. What did he actually say? <laughs> Utos hopoloi an summa esmen en Christo, trodecathes ele lon moet mele. Help. <laughs> United you are the body of Christ, but each of you is a different part of it. <laughs> Don't go, madame. Continue your work here. The God of love is also the God of truth. Love and truth, they both matter. I enjoy your company. That's to say, I, I enjoy your stimulating ideas. And the fact that I am female? All that God made is good, and he made them male and female. <laughs> Over your dead body. <laughs> You're incorrigible, Father Teor, but I'll stay. There's a letter come for you, Father. I've made a little progress, Joseph, but not as much as I would like. I'm sorry to hear that, Madame Vea Couturier. How's your husband? As generous as ever. Is he indeed? What? What is it? This is a letter from the Father Provincial in Lyon. Uh, your boss? Yes. Apparently someone has sent a copy of my original sin essay to Rome to the Jesuit general. It seems Father General is uh, disturbed. He feels my views may not be orthodox. I am to go to Lyon and prove to Father Provincial that I'm not a heretic. I went to Lyon a day early and stayed with an old friend. Female. A Jesuit. Together we worked out my response to Rome's demand. What was Rome's demand? You, you haven't told me. They wanted me to promise I would never again speak or write anything contrary to the traditional teaching of the Church on original sin. Well now, I felt that that was both too vague and too absolute. I believe I have the right to study the subject at least. And what's more, as a priest, I have a duty to help anyone with a difficulty with the doctrine, and there are plenty of those. And that's what you told Father Provincial the next morning. Did he bite your head off? Not at all. He's on my side, if anything. We talked for a while, and then I gave him the statement I'd typed out the night before. Which said? Which said that my essay was merely a provisional attempt to reconcile the dogma of original sin with the facts of experience, 
I promised that from now on I would be extremely cautious in discussing the subject and more clearly orthodox. That statement is now on its way to Rome. End of story? End of story. I'm a very small fish in a very big pond. Good. I was worried about you. Pierre, I've got a New Year present for you. Well, better late than never, but you'll like this one. The facts of experience get bigger every day. Guess what's in today's paper? Our galaxy isn't the only one. There are other galaxies, lots of them. The universe is even bigger than we thought. Indeed. <sighs> Who discovered this, Einstein? Uh, Dr. Edwin Hubble, American, of course. Isn't it exciting? Relatively. Your Vatican guys are going to have a problem spreading original sin to all these other worlds. Adam and Eve, time travelers, have eaten apples in over a thousand galaxies so far. Come on, fellers, give the snake a break. Aren't you pleased? I'm afraid my Vatican guys have something else on their minds at the moment. They didn't accept your statement? Absolutely not. Worse. They have descended from the general to the particular. They want me to agree to six propositions. What? Here. Well, it's in Latin. You'll have to help. <clears throat> All but one are taken from the decrees of the general councils. The first three are from the Council of Trent. <laughs> In the 16th century. Five and six are from the Vatican Council. Oh, only 50 years ago, practically yesterday. <laughs> to the church, yes. Uh, she thinks in centuries. And there's one other, the fourth proposition. Not from a council? No. From Father General himself, I suppose, or his theologians. That's the tricky one. The whole human race takes its origin from one proto-parent, Adam. This fourth proposition is no whether explicitly defined, but it's plainly implicit in the third decree. And that's the proposition you can't agree to. It is. Because they're mixing theology with science. And getting it wrong. It's Galileo all over again. Their theology is right, but their science is wrong. Well, will you write to Rome? Oh, yes. I will say I'm happy to repudiate, absolutely sincerely, anything in my essay that contradicts the six propositions. <laughs> but that still leaves the problem dangling in midair, completely unresolved. How are you going to reconcile what Genesis tells us about the origin of man with what science tells us? Someone's going to have to do it! The church can't just ignore the problem like the Scottish preacher. I don't know that one. <laughs> the Scottish preacher said to his congregation one day, and now we come to the very difficult passage of Scripture, very difficult and mysterious indeed, and having stared it boldly in the face, we pass on. Father Tayar, you believe in Christ and St. Paul. I believe in Marx and Lenin. I believe the revolution will come, and I warn you that when it does come, it will destroy religion along with capitalism, because... It doesn't it occur to you that communism is a religion? And is it surprising? Marx was a Jew. The workers are the chosen people, and he was a new messiah preaching the promised land. I would rather fight for a paradise on earth where all men are equal than flee the world and, and spend my life praying for pie in the sky. Have I fled the world? Do I fear matter? I worship matter. It's the vehicle of grace. I believe the task of any Christian is build the earth, not deny it. To, to make our way to heaven through earth. But heaven is a fantasy, Pierre. And Marx's dream of a classless society is not. A world where the state has vanished and all men are free, free to say, mm, I'll design the dresses and you dig the coal. You write about Shakespeare and I'll clean the sewers. Of, of course you have to have a ruling elite. I hate you because you stand for everything I loathe about the bourgeoisie. I hate you because you've tried to destroy everything I believe in and hold dear. I'm sorry. And I love you. I love you, Pierre. God knows why, but I do. The attraction of opposites? Thesis and antithesis? Don't laugh at me, Pierre. Don't you dare laugh at me. I have bared my soul to you. I am in love and defenseless. I tried to destroy your faith in Marx because I want you to have faith in Christ. You coward! I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
Very well. I will try to be as brave as you, and as honest. Uh, there's a, a letter come for you from Rome, Father. I thought it might be urgent. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> They still want me to sign the propositions. They are implacable. And Father General has some special piece of advice to console and guide me. <clears throat> the Catholic scientist has an infallible rule to save him from useless trouble. He must dismiss a priori anything that contradicts Catholic dogma. Lunacy. Complete lunacy! Don't they realise there's an army on its way ready to tear down this citadel that they've retreated to? Are they utterly blind? Pierre. Pierre. What happens now? I'm going to have to think. I'm in shock. F forgive me. How can I go on like this week after week? The whole human race takes its origin from one proto-parent, Adam. It is false. It is false! But how can I defy them? Why not defy them? If you know they are wrong, if you know better than they do, my dear love, I can't bear to see you suffer. I told you why not. It's God's voice I hear when my superior gives me an order. But your God is the God of truth, isn't he? So how can his ministers demand you sign a lie? It's your duty to defy them. <laughs> is it, Ida? Is it? I feel I'm torn between my two vocations, the one I followed as a lad of 18 and the one revealed to me when I was a man. Which is the most sacred? How can I choose between them? Ida, help me. Help me! You told me you're a soldier, subject to a general. So obey the order, sign the propositions. It wouldn't mean you think they're true, only that you're a good soldier. Don't you think that's a bit Jesuitical? Sign, and still it moves. I forget my own name. There's another letter for you, Father. <coughs> Thank you, Joseph. Right. Madame. Roma lacuta est. Causa finita est. Roma has spoken. It's all over. I have to resign as professor of geology at the Catholic Institute and never teach at the Institute again. And I'm to return to China and do my geology there and only ever write on purely scientific matters. And of course, I have to sign the six propositions. Nothing will ever destroy my belief in God. But at this moment, it is very difficult for me to believe in the church. Yes. This unbelievable fourth proposition. Is this, in fact, a sign from God to go my own way? Start a new religion? <laughs> is my love for you, this overwhelming, blinding Damascus revelation, has it come from the God of love? Does he want me to love you as a man loves a woman? After all these years, have I been wrong about my vocation to the priesthood? Yeah. Universum ganus hominum, ex uno protoparente adam ortum habuit. How can I sign that? I shall cause scandal if I refuse to sign and leave the Jesuits. Leave the church. I shall cause scandal if I do sign. Ida will be devastated, will know I have betrayed the science I have served so faithfully for so long, betrayed her belief in me, betrayed her love for me. My love for her, I confess it. What did Newman do when he was torn between the Church of England and the Church of Rome? 
Augustine, in his hour of agony, opened the Bible and read and was saved. I have no Bible here, just the exercises and the apologia. <laughs> There is a time for everything, and many a man desires a reformation of an abuse or the fuller development of a doctrine or the adoption of a particular policy, but forgets to ask himself whether the right time for it has come. And knowing that there is no one who will be doing anything towards its accomplishment in his own lifetime unless he does it himself, he will not listen to the voice of authority, and he spoils a good work in his own century in order that another man, as yet unborn, may not have the opportunity of bringing it happily to perfection in the next. Newman locutus est. Causa finita est. I accept these propositions in the full sense that Holy Mother Church gives them. And despite the impression I may have given, I sign them most willingly, because I have always wanted to let them dominate all scientific truth. Profoundly convinced that human science only has value if it comes from Christ and leads us back to him, I absolutely, I'm absolutely determined to set the revealed figure of our Lord Jesus Christ in its integrity and perfect reality above all scientific truth. Paris, 1st of July, 1925. Pierre. Théâtre de Chalain. The hardest part will be telling Ida when I come back. <laughs>